Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity. This is session two of the Crop Life Conference of 2022. Um, the heading of this session, the stewardship compliance, are you a responsible registration holder? Now, in re a registration holder in South Africa, we refer to the manufacturers and the suppliers of agrochemical products into the market uh, that the farmers or the growers use. I just first like to um, introduce my panel or the speakers. Here on my, on my right hand side is Dr. Gerard van Doren from CropLife, Dr. Elmi, Elmay Kutse Boersma from Global Gap, and then also Inc. van der Westhuizen. He's from uh, um, uh, Filagro, and then from the link, uh, uh, Fani Meyer. And uh, yeah, I would like to first. Our first presenter is Hink van der Weijstezen. He's the managing director of Filagro, a multinational company. Um, he's the first, he, his title is, How far does the responsibility of the registration holder go? Thank you. Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hink van der Weijstezen. I'm a, a MD of a, of a company which is proudly a member of CropLife, and uh, I want to thank CropLife for giving me the opportunity to discuss uh, a topic of great importance this morning, and um, thank you very much. Uh, the topic that I will be looking at is uh, stewardship and compliance. How far does the responsibility of the registration holder go? Let's start with some definitions. Uh, I looked at a couple of definitions for compliance and found one or two interesting ones. The act of complying to an order, a rule or a request, Cambridge Dictionary. And then one that um, many of uh, folks of my generation will be quite familiar with, as you can see from the little graphic on, on the bottom right hand side there. Physics, the property of a material of undergoing elastic deformation when subjected to an applied force. This is equal to the reciprocal of stiffness. Now, I'm sure that many of you can recognize exactly what that means. And for, for, uh, the, for this discussion, I will actually look at compliance and stewardship separately because I believe, although they are intermingled, um, I believe there are two uh, quite different spectrums that we need to have a look at. My wife used to watch the Oprah Winfrey show every single day and Oprah Winfrey said that in, in any industry or indeed any life, there are a few key moments that has an impact on such an industry or life. And that certainly holds true. So these may include, but are not limited to, to uh, birth, of course. Now, on December the 17th in 1903, Orville Wright became the first person to power a to pilot a powered aeroplane, the Wright Flyer, which was built by himself and his brother Wilbur. Before them, there were guys that flew in hot air balloons and also some gliders, but the first powered flight was the Wright Flyer at Kitty Hawk on this particular day, and the plane stayed aloft for around 200 meters. Thank you. Then we move on to early growth and development. Now a Frenchman by the name of Louis Blériot crossed the English Channel in his monoplane on July the 25th of 1909. Now a monoplane, for those who do not know, as pictured on the right, is a single winged aeroplane. And uh, you can see that is uh, quite a flimsy piece of machinery and he managed to cross the English Channel, the first person to do so. Going into adolescence, the first prototype of the iconic supermarine Spitfire took place on March the 5th, 1936. And that, that uh, um, prototype is a picture at the bottom left. And on the right hand side, you see the, one of the most beautiful flying machines ever created. And it played a very significant role in the Battle of Britain. And then we reach the stage of adulthood. And I'd like to show you a video. In October 1947, at Muroc Desert Test Center in California, history is made by this aircraft, the XS-1, and its pilot, Captain Charles E. Yeager. This airplane and this pilot are about to be the first ever to fly faster than the speed of sound in level flight. A B-29 will take the XS-1 aloft, and launch her at an altitude of about 35,000 feet. 
The XS-1 is not a military aircraft, but a flying research laboratory designed to test the effects of supersonic flight upon airplanes. It is powered by four rocket engines. Its weight empty is less than 5,000 pounds, but it carries 8,000 pounds of fuel. B-29s have done a lot of memorable things, but none of them ever before had a mission quite like this one. And no airplane ever did what the XS-1 is about to do. Tracking the sound barrier in level flight will be more than a spectacular feat. It will also give the Air Force valuable knowledge of the resources of new propulsive systems. Captain Yeager gets aboard the XS-1. It can't be a long flight he's going to have in the little aircraft. At full power, the flight can't last more than two and a half minutes. But it's going to be a fast one. crews are ready too to do the timing the only possible method for timing aircraft at extremely high altitudes there she goes a big moment in a history making flight now she's approaching the barrier the speed of sound at 35,000 feet is 660 miles per hour. The really big moment. Through the sound barrier. The first time ever in level flight. For the first time, except in dives, a man has flown an airplane faster than the speed of sound. It earned Captain Yeager many honors. And the historic plane, the XS-1, earned a resting place in the Smithsonian Institution. Aviation enthusiasts refer to the breaking of the sound barrier that you've just witnessed as the most important turning point in aviation. And a few months before Jack Yeager broke the sound barrier, the, the turning point in the industry that we are involved in today occurred on January the 17th, 1947. Now you may well wonder what aviation and our act has in common. Well, there are quite a few common grounds. As you will see, compliance and stewardship are critical to the safe aeronautical industry, and they are all cr also critical in our industry. And I also share this video and this information about aviation with you because Together with my passion for aviation, I have a passion for our act and our industry and compliance and stewardship towards our industry. So there it is, Act number 36 of 1947, promulgated in 1947. You may wonder why I use the comparative uh, or the comparison with aviation when, when looking at the responsibility of the registration holders. Um, it is because uh, these are two of my real passions, aviation, but also the Act 36 and our industry. And there are some comparisons because both industries can only survive and can only move forward and improve their image if they uh, comply in all aspects to the, the relevant acts and regulations. And if they have a, a high sense of stewardship that they also apply to their industries. As we know, just as per a recent example, uh, compliance issues led to the grounding of some of the airways in South Africa. Uh, fortunately, that has been lifted, but that was just an example of the importance of compliance in, in this industry. Act 36 of 1947, the definition and the name of the act was to provide for the registration of fertilizers, farm feeds, sterilizing plants, and certain remedies to regulate the importation and sale of fertilizers, farm feeds, seeds, and certain remedies, and to provide for matters incidental thereto. In 1970, the title and the contents of the act was changed 
to include agricultural remedies with the following definition. Any chemical substance or biological remedy or mixtures or combinations of any sub, 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 substance or remedy intended to be used for the destruction, control, repelling or prevention of any undesirable virus, bacterium, algae, nematode, fungus, insect, plant, vertebrate, invertebrate or any product thereof but excluding products controlled under the Medicinal, Dental and Pharmacy Act, Food, Drug and Disinfections Act, and Drugs Control Act. The Act has gone through various upgrades and changes, and many regulations have been published over the years. But I will only focus on a few of the points where the role of the registration holder may sometimes be misunderstood or unclear or not properly implemented. Advertisements. This is any, any printed material whatsoever or any oral statement brought to the members of the public intended to promote the sale or use thereof or draw attention to the nature, properties, advantages or uses thereof. Please remember that no advertising message or claims that you make that do not appear on the approved label may appear on any advertisement. I unfortunately see quite a few adverts where this is transgressed. The question always comes up if a handout such as a pen with purely a product name printed on it is considered an advertisement and should be approved by the registrar. Well, I certainly believe although it is an advertisement, there's no need for approval. I think approval starts when uh, a claim pertaining to that particular product being advertised is being made. The label. Any written, printed or graphic matter attached to any container of an ag remedy that states the particulars which are to be furnished in respect of the ag remedy concerned. I more frequently see printed labels which do not conform to the regulations in terms of the layout. These are very clear as stipulated in the regulations. And uh, as I mentioned, I see more and more labels that no longer adhere to these regulations. Each and every proposed change to a label must be approved by the regulators, including changes to the acts or the regulations promulgated by the registration uh, by the registrar and the regulators themselves. Please keep this in mind. Sell, goodness gracious, there are many transgressions regarding the sale of products purely because I think we tend to um, forget what exactly the definition is within the act. This includes agree to sell or to offer, advertise, keep, expose, transmit, convey, deliver or manufacture for sale or to exchange or to dispose of any consideration whatever or to transmit, convey or deliver in pursuance of a sale. Making a recommendation or delivering a product to anybody to use a product is clearly a sell. In other words, if you take a product that is not registered to a farmer and you deliver this to him and he uses that product, although it's not registered on your recommendation, then it is considered a sell. No person shall sell any of the above unless it is registered under the act under the name under which it is registered. It is packed in such a manner and mass or volume as registered. Container in which it is sold complies with com prescribed requirements and the composition and efficacy specified in the application for the registration and the label uh, complies with the requirements. Furthermore, the sale of fertilizers, farm feeds, ag remedies and stock remedies, no person shall for reward or in the course of any industry, trade or business, use or recommend the use of any agricultural remedy or stock remedy for the purpose or in a manner other than specified on the label. So it is very clear that this portion of the Act includes any staff member of the registration holder of the said product, any staff member of a distributor of said product, the farmer or the grower or any other end user. And here we should also include consultants. And I think this is an area where crop life and the registrar have to look at very carefully. We know that some consultants do not adhere to uh, the Act uh, very, very uh, closely. So this is definitely an area which we need to investigate. Some other relevant Acts. 
the hazardous substance acts number 15 of 1973 to provide for the control of substances which may cause injury or ill health to or death of human beings by reason of their toxic irritant corrosive or strongly sensitizing or flammable nature this act was promulgated in 1973 and that is the year looking at the aeroplane on the right hand side there that this um, aeroplane which is a triple f 144 was flown and displayed at the paris air show for the first time this aeroplane was a copy uh, of um, the a russian version of the copied uh, concorde the uh, supersonic airliner built by by britain and france unfortunately the f 144 crashed uh, broke up in midair and crashed during the Paris Air Show of 1973, putting an end to the production of that aeroplane and the dreams of the Russians. The National Road Transport Act nine, uh, number 1993 of 1996, to provide for road traffic matters which shall apply uniformly through the Republic and for matters connected therewith. Now, in 1996, Comair, aeroplane pictured on the left, and British Airways, pictured on the right, merged to form a company called British Airways, um, managed by Comair in South Africa. Now, they were recently in the news, as you know, because of compliance issues. Fortunately, that has now been cleared. Some other relevant documents or codes published, which I think we should take cognizance of, include SABS number 0228 and SANS 101, uh, 10231, the transport of dangerous goods. The airplane you see there is an Airbus Guppy. This is a transport airplane specifically built by Airbus to transport various parts of the Airbus uh, airliners that we see today to Toulouse in France, where they are uh, assembled. It comes from all over Europe, Italy, England, France, different parts transported in that little airplane. Well, it's not a little airplane, it's quite a big airplane. Then SABS 0229, packaging of dangerous goods. And there you can see um, a, a huge amount of packed material ready to be uploaded into a cargo aeroplane. You can see these um, parcels are well labeled and uh, these uh, will definitely confine or, or will, will adhere to the, um, to the restrictions and the regulations of the packaging of dangerous goods. The aeroplane in the background is an Antonov uh, 225. It is the biggest and heaviest aeroplane ever built. It has a, a capacity, a load capacity of about 250 tons, which equates to between 50 African elephants um, that can be loaded on this aeroplane. Unfortunately and sadly, this aeroplane, there was only one ever built, became one of the first victims of the Ukraine-Russian war when it was destroyed while standing in a hangar in the Ukraine. SAB, it's 0263, the storage of dangerous goods. On the right hand side, an American site called the Boneyard, where the Americans store military aeroplanes that are no longer used. Now you can see they store them in the desert, it's very dry, there's very low humidity, so the actual problems with um, uh, the, the non-performance of these aeroplanes over a long period is, 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 is not a problem. And you'll see there are a massive amount of aeroplanes. In fact, there are more aeroplanes in the American boneyards than the South African Air Force has had in its entire lifetime. So, in conclusion, looking at compliance, I believe the registration holder has a responsibility. And, and these, these include to obtain, expand and maintain the registration as prescribed under Act 36 to ensure the product label attached to the container reflects the contents of the container and all other relevant information as required and registered under Act 36 and in the prescribed format. And as far as possible and practical to ensure that the product is recommended and used as per the registered label. So let's look at stewardship. There are couple of definitions of stewardship, but they have a common thread. The responsible overseeing and protection of something worth caring for and preserving. Stewardship is an ethic that embodies the careful planning and management of resources. The concept of stewardship can be applied to the environment and nature, economics, theology, etc. 
Stewardship is a crop is a, a, a stewardship is a life cycle approach to crop protection product management to ensure safe production, transportation, storage, handling, application, and use of the product, as well as the proper disposal of waste. This is the definition that can be found on the Crop Life South Africa website. What is the life cycle approach? The life cycle approach to stewardship is a responsible and ethical way to manage crop protection products from their discovery and development to their use and the final disposal of any waste. The overall aim of the stewardship approach is to maximize the benefits and minimize any risk from using crop protection products. So you can see it starts with research and development where brand new materials, brand new actives are discovered through to the manufacturing process and the plants that manufacture these, the storage, transportation, distribution, packaging, et cetera, et cetera, of these products, integrated pest management and responsible use on application and the relevant uh, products being applied to relevant uh, areas of control, container management and manage, management and disposal of the obsolete stocks, a life cycle approach. Thank you. Apart from the life cycle approach, what should responsible registration holders do to ensure proper and thorough stewardship? These are just a few points that I think are very important and I'd like to bring to your attention. A well-constructed and a practical disaster management plan. This can happen at any time and registration holders should be um, responsible, very responsible in this particular area. Implement quality control measures, not only for the technical grade materials, but also for the formulated products. Audits on formulators, transporters, storage companies, all these people should from time to time, I believe, undergo some sort of audit managed by the registration holder to ensure that all relevant acts and regulations are adhered to. Then legally binding distribution contracts which address risk areas such as product liability issues and responsibilities. We all know that from the minute that we lodge a claim, one of the first things that, the, that, that will be asked by the insurers is to have a look at the product liability issue and uh, responsibilities. And I'm sure Mr. Brian Karen will address that later on tomorrow as well. Intertrading of products and supply to poorly trained agents. This is cause of concern for many of us. Training of people in the value chain, for example, the safe handling and the responsible use of products and if applicable, specific storage and shelf life conditions. Uh, pertaining to training, um, there are in incredibly helpful uh, pieces of, of, of learning that can be downloaded from the crop life website and I and I, I implore people to visit the website and to make use of all those materials. They really are excellent. So apart from the life cycle approach, what should responsible registration holders do to ensure proper and thorough stewardship? There should be more involvement in the efforts of Crop Life South Africa and I cannot emphasize this anymore. I've been a member of the EXCO Committee of Crop Life for many, many years, and I find it very sad to see that there is still not sufficient involvement in all of the crop life activities and committees by the registration holders and other members. So please be part of the solution, not the problem. We always see the same people serving all the committees. Come on, people. This is in everybody's uh, to, everybody can gain from being more involved with crop life activities. So be part of the solution, not the problem. A responsible registration holder should only be satisfied that a proper stewardship program has been implemented once his product has been used in accordance with the label and results obtained as stipulated on the label have been achieved and after the empty containers have been collected for recycling. And just in conclusion, my pet hate, never, ever, ever casually refer to the products that we sell as GIF. Just last night again in a television program, there was a, there was a, a leading farmer that said, 
the, the prices of GIF have increased incredibly by 50 or 100 percent this year. I cringe when I hear people use the word GIF. We're not selling GIF. We're selling r registered agricultural remedies. In conclusion, just another comment about my passion for aviation and inclusion of aviation slides in this presentation. This presentation, I think, would have been incredibly boring if I didn't find something interesting to tell you people and to try and keep you awake as well. So thank you very much again for the opportunity to make this presentation and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you, Inc., for this informative presentation and your comparison with aviation and our industry. Uh, just to, for interesting, um, our Act is from 1947, Act 36 is 75 years old this year. So is it old or is it new beginnings? I think there's uh, quite a few questions regarding the Act and please uh, you can comment, uh, send your questions in a comment column and we, as a panel, will address it later. Um, my next speaker is uh, Mfani Meyer. Um, he's an export producer, but he's actually a director of the company called Unifruity. It's a big enterprise in the, um, the fruit industry. He's got extensive knowledge in the crop protection industry and also on the export of uh, uh, produce all over the world. And I think... Uh, and finally, he's got a, um, his knowledge, he would like to um, uh, give it to us today. Uh, I think we can learn a lot from his uh, experience. And finally, thanks a lot. We're look, looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, maybe good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you, uh, Mr. Facilitator, Mr. Croft. My topic is, what does the export producer expect from the registration holder? Now, I'm going to talk about the citrus production because that's my field of expertise. As a starter, I would like to give a quick overview of the Southern African citrus production. When it comes to the, the world's global citrus production, we only come in at number 12. And uh, that's behind the, the biggies like China, Brazil, and India, who've got umpteen times more uh, citrus than we have. However, when we come to global citrus ports, and this survey was done in 2019, 2020, uh, you will see that South Africa, Southern Africa fills the number two position behind Spain uh, during this survey. Also, our main competitors from the Southern Hemisphere, and they've got the same marketing window as us, are Egypt, mainly with oranges, and Argentina, mainly with lemons. Okay, the production areas in Southern Africa. Uh, Limpopo leads the way with nearly 40% of the total hectares in Southern Africa. And the first three regions, that's Limpopo, Eastern Cape, Western Cape, make up 85% of the total in Southern Africa. Uh, we call it Southern Africa because Zimbabwe and Swaziland's production is included. But Swaziland now is Eswatini. Okay, export tons, if we look at the differences with a bit of history, a 10 year history, we see that oranges, which includes Valencias and Navels, as well as grapefruit that includes Star Ruby and Marsh, they're fairly stable and uh, their output is, uh, is fairly constant. However, if we come to the two for the lemons, and the mandarins, there's like almost exponential growth in volume. And there's a lot of young trees still to come into production. 
And the big question is, where's the market for all this fruit? If we look at the target markets, uh, where we market our fruit, uh, Europe, or the EU, is still the leader with 36%, but with severe phytosanitary restrictions of zero tolerance on CBS, such as black spot and FCM, false cotton moth. So one black spot in a container is a disqualification and one live larvae in a container is a disqualification. You've got to reroute the fruit away from the leaf. Also interesting there is uh, <laughs> the current uh, situation in Russia, which takes 8% uh, or 13 million cartons of our fruit. And where that's going to end up, probably in other markets, is still to be seen as of uh, at the moment. An advantage that has happened in term of, terms of Brexit is that uh, the split from the EU has, uh, has favorable terms for us in terms of residues and phyto restrictions. They don't have the black spot and the false cotton mod because probably there's, well, I know there is no citrus production in the UK. And that, ma that makes it to uh, easier access. The Middle East, very important market, uh, but it is mainly Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi, as most people think. North America is, co is a combination of the USA and Canada. Okay, if we look at production costs um, in citrus, uh, this was a benchmark exercise in uh, 2020 of uh, participating producers in the Letitele and Woodspray regions. And uh, the participating units uh, showed an ag chem value of 281,4 million. If we take all the production costs, we're looking at a, a 1 billion. Uh, pie chart uh, of those that, that were part participating. Now, AirChem represents 28% of the production costs. This used to be much lower. And uh, again, the 28% is an average of all the, uh, the farmers. Another way of putting it, uh, the average benchmark was uh, 23,865 rand per hectare spent on agrochemicals or 754 per ton. Uh, so the ag chem, you have uh, as number one, and then the labor cost split between production and harvesting, and then fertilizer maintenance, uh, there's some other production costs. But at the moment, fuel and oil and electricity uh, are way below, and uh, the expectation is that those segments will arise with the current situations. Okay, now the question of my is, are you a responsible registration holder? And the producer doesn't always know who has the registration. Is it the manufacturer? Is it the distributor? Or is it the representative? And then also the whole uh, meaning of stewardship compliance. In the ag chem business, the companies have to comply with the relevant laws, regulations, standards, and ethical practices. Okay, now, however, there's a limitation of warranty and liability on most labels that says you've got to read this limitation and warranty before buying or using the product. The term, if the terms are not acceptable, return the product at once, unopened, and the purchase price will be refunded. And then another one. Come up be responsible for losses or damages resulting from the use of this product in any manner not specifically directed by the company. 
the user assumes all risks associated with such non-directed use. So, the user assumes all risk and the registration holder is not responsible. Okay, as an as a exporter, we also have uh, compliance. And the first one is uh, Global GAP, which is international. And that's an annual audit that keep, keeps on getting more complicated and more strict. First of all, there's also compliance to the South African National Standards for agrochemicals. There's hurdles that you have to jump over, like water quality, sanitation facilities, filling point pollution. That's where you uh, you fill the tanks or the sprayers, as well as protective clothing for each category of farm worker. Health and safety requirements, and then also. Uh, specifically for the ag chem industry, annual blood test for org organophosphate presence. That is the, um, the, the, the test that looks at coding esterase. But there's nothing else that blood tests uh, can reveal. The second compliance we have to do is the CESA audit, which stands for Sustainability Initiative of South Africa. You have ethical and environmental audits. They look at accommodation of workers, working hours, as well as overtime hours, sanitation facilities, and protective clothing, uh, conditions, freedom of association and collective bargaining, it's uh, unions, strict measurements of water quality and soil, and also where do you discharge after using, and then uh, an all-encompassing farm ecosystem as well as biodiversity on the farms. Also, energy, materials, and waste with, a, with an accent on waste. So the Caesar audit is a firewall between the supermarkets and the producers. Because before Caesar, you would have multiple down to the farm and, and looking at different uh, <laughs> different conditions and, and especially with accommodation and sanitation, etc. People like Tesco, Lidl, and Erica, as an example. The Caesar audit uh, depends on the frequency uh, if you have either a silver, gold, or platinum status, and uh, that that determines your, your frequency. If you've got a gold status, it's every two years. A platinum is every three years. Then Caesar is also the same as global, global gap, getting more complicated and voluminous. It just becomes more and more. Then we come to market access, which is becoming <laughs> the most important aspect of, of farming these days, especially if you're an exporter. So apart from efficacy, the MRL's maximum residue limits are the most important. MRL's constantly change and affect market access. Representatives don't always have the up-to-date knowledge and are reluctant to recommend a solution to the problems. There's big differences between the countries with the same chemical. And you cannot prepare an orchard for a market because different sizes of fruit have different markets. You could have market access to the EU but then also supermarkets have their own restrictions, restrictions, and this is particularly true for the German supermarkets. The drive is to have zero residues, but still unblemished fruit, a very tall order. Another thing that uh, is problematic for us is the huge lack of residue analysis after the expiry of a patent. And the question is, whose responsibility is this? 
There's also a constant change of maximum residue levels, and usually that goes downwards and less. The other thing about residues in citrus, it is mainly concentrated in the rind of the fruit. And as we all know, normal people do not eat citrus peels. However, you've got to cater for the housewives and the factories that make marmalade. Uh, Jamie Oliver that uses zest of uh, lemons and oranges without wax. So that is why the whole fruit is tested. However, it all sits in the rind, which sometimes seems a bit unfair. If a patent has uh, and the genetics appear, uh, appear, there's generally no further residue analysis that takes place. Now, as an example, buprofesin or plod, uh, is a critical chemical or a tool against mealybug and citrus that's becoming more and more important. For instance, the Korean market for grapefruit is very important and they don't want any sign of a mealybug and even sooty mold uh, should not appear on the fruit. So when it was registered in the EU, the residue was 0 0.05 parts per million. And at 28 days, the fruit was suitable for export. Now, the, the residue has been lowered to 0 0.1 ppm, and nobody knows how many days that takes to be safe. Okay, if uh, I understand that if you have uh, genetic, genetic active registrations, in other words, new uh, genetics, uh, you've basically got to uh, prove chemical equivalence and only do 30% efficacy on the uh, crops and, and uses uh, registered on the original product. Okay, then there's this other thing of, that we used to call the 3M products, muck, manure, and mystery. Now this includes all these adjuvants like wetters, stickers, pH buffers, etc. It's got an influence on cost as well as MRLs. And then also the half-life of chemicals. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about that. I used to have a friend which says, uh, uh, if you give someone a ball of steel wool or certain people, they will knit you a stone. And that is sometimes happening with half-life of chemicals. Then you get the whole story of biostimulants that that uh, claim yield increases. So the addition of wetters and stickers, is this really necessary? And what is in the product formulation, the original one? Because we believe there's, the formulators are top class chemists, uh, but the labels are totally silent on adjuvants. And the effect of prolonging the breakdown of the residue can be influenced by the addition of wetters and stickers, but we don't always know it. And that can disqualify you from having market access. The same with uh, half-life of chemicals with all these pH buffers. Again, what is in the formulation? Isn't it already incorporated? And then to claim yield increases without statistical analysis is actually useless. The latest one is NETS. Uh, more and more citrus uh, production is taking place under NETS. And it has been shown that because of the milder climate inside the NETS, it also takes the, the product longer to break down. Okay, the representation of the re re registrations, this is, the, this is where the rubber hits the road. We, as uh, exporters, get most of our information from the, the representatives, chemical companies that visit us. Uh, and this is overwhelming our contact point with the registration holder. My normal question is, what value can you add? 
what can you bring to the farm that can add value? The thing they want is integrity and honesty individual. Now that's so awesome for someone who's selling product. Then the knowledge, the expertise, and the network they uh, rely on is also belong uh, is also important. Uh, the stock situation. Uh, a lot of farmers feel that uh, they are using them as, as storage. They come with, with uh, the argument that uh, the product is in short supply, so buy now and buy enough. And then you sit at the end of the production year with a store full of ke chemicals that cost a lot. They also expect the uh, representative to regular visits with the producer in the orchard to share his knowledge and ex expertise. The representatives are also a fine uh, fountain of what are the area trends. They know they move around and what is working and what is not. Remember the farmer is sitting is sedentary, he's sitting still, but the representative is moving around. And then finally, there's a perception that uh, they live like rock stars. It looks like that with the amount of profit they make. And one uh, of my friends said, when he comes back to Earth in re reincarnation, he wants to be the Chafsmos because it looks like they have heaven on Earth. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my talk. Uh, please, if are questions, uh, I am open uh, for, for them and I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Vani, thank you very much for that uh, practical insight. I think it's you, uh, out of a, a point of view of the, on the practical side, on the receiving end of the registration. And uh, we really, really appreciate your honesty. I think there will be a, quite a few questions uh, that we can discuss here in the, uh, in, in the panel. Um, I would like to ask El May, um, part of our panel, to just what is your take on these two presentations and your view, as I can mention a few th on, on the global gap issues and the international regulatory phase. Yes, thanks, Ben. Um, are you okay? Have you survived the last comment? <laughs> <laughs> um, I really appreciated Hank's um, presentation with the analogy to aviation um, in our industry with global gap, focusing on food safety and covering that way not only food safety, but also worker, workers' health and safety and sustainability, environmental sustainability, as well as social sustainability. We use the wording HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points, and aviation has also been used in aviation. Sorry, aviation has been used in HACCP also to, to develop those, those methods. And so some of the underlying elements that the Hink brought in makes you wonder where the act is. If it crashed in 1973, is it too heavy? What's happening? A long discussion that can follow on that. Um, in terms of uh, Fani's presentation with Global Gap, yes, of course, I need to say something. Um, yes, the standard is getting heavier. As I said, we, we cover certain elements and um, we believe that uh, the compliance from a producer side and the stewardship that they need to show in terms of uh, the use of plant production products or um, the, the remedies, uh, they need to show that they use the materials in a consistent way, that they're responsible. That not only links up with food safety and the safety of the consumers and the due diligence that the retailers have to show. And we look at all the different acts that come into play for those that buy the products from the, from the producers. So there's such a long supply chain and every one of these need to show their, um, their due diligence and that they are complying with many, many, many requirements. And yes, unfortunately, it starts with producers at some point in time. And using responsibly the, the plant protection products is very critical for us as well. We know that there are many issues in terms of uh, complying with maximum residue levels, like Fani mentioned, the, especially the German retailers uh, focusing on zero residues. Is that even possible? How do you measure it? Is it? Does it make sense? 
the industry is already measuring the toxicity and all the, all the things that they have to do. So what does that mean? You know, I many times have the question, so if it's zero, does it mean it's safer? For whom and what does that mean? And the answers are not there. So yeah, there's many things that we can argue about. Um, it's interesting, the, the citrus industry is, is an interesting one with its own challenges. And um, then even if we talk about vegetable production, in South Africa, we have our own limitations, also in other countries, when we talk about the specialty crops or minor crops where there's not even registration. So that's a different step and a different level where producers um, have a lot of issues of complying with the requirements of Act 47, for example, or then also with global gap requirements, because our first and foremost requirement is to comply with local regulations. Thank you, Elmay. Uh, Gerard, what is your view on Make a few comments on these two presentations. Um, I found them quite interesting. Um, both Hink and Farney touch on topics which were broader than what the, the, the idea was for this particular session. And it was quite a good idea then for them to broaden the perspectives and the scopes to, to illustrate to all of us what is the, um, the issue that the farmer faces on the ground. Because we always talk about stewardship within the agrochemical arena or call it the crop protection arena because we also include biologicals there. But at the end, there's the farmer who's got to use all these products and he's got a lot of compliance issues, also stewardship issues. But I think one thing that came out for me in terms of what both Henk and Farney said was this, you can call it the near disjunct between the principle of compliance and the parallel principle of, of um, stewardship. And if you look at pure compliance, pure compliance to me is that you have to abide by the statutes of the country, whether it's an act or regulation or a policy or an SAB standard. That's what you have to do. You don't get away from that. The stewardship thing is like Heng said and Farney also brought in, it's more of an ethical thing. It's what do I want to do? What do I need to do to create a better image of myself and to produce a safer food stuff and to look after my farm workers? and all that sort of stuff. And I don't think we always have that clear understanding in our entire value chain market from the manufacturer right down to the farm level of this parallel avenue we've got to follow. In other words, you have to buy by the law. But what is the right thing to do? In CropLife SA, we developed the concept of we do things not because the act is there, not because the government is there. It's because it's the right thing to do. And we can see it coming out at certain farm levels. And I talk to many farmers. I'm privileged to be able to talk to farmers from the small level right up to the big commercial level. And I see this quest on the agricultural side, the producer side, to do the right thing with or without this um, sword hanging over the heads of the compliance issues. When I go back into our own industry and listening to what, what Hank said is that there's a very clear conscience, I think, in our members in CropLife SA, and for that matter, for the broad agricultural arena for the crop protection industry is we have to comply. Yes, some people will never comply. It's not in the nature to comply. Most people want to comply, even though there are a couple of hiccups, and they try their best to comply. But the stewardship thing is hanging there nebulous. And I don't think this stewardship thing has really hit home Internationally, because I've had meetings with international and I've had meetings with local, I'm a stewardship manager for our industry and I don't think the stewardship thing has really hit home yet. And we can look at, for example, um, things like what Fani now mentioned, the MRL issue, the residue issue, the PHI issue, and working through Agri-Intel with Shana Liu, who's our manager for Agri-Intel, we audit labels and we come across serious issues with labels where you can't find an MRL, you can't find a pre PHR, you can't find a withholding period. And that is coming back to where is that ethic at the level of the supply company who is mostly the registration holder. So that is something which I think we should bring back to the book that the registration holder has a very serious ethical issue, not just a compliance issue. It's an ethical thing to say, if I send my product to market, right down to farm in the farm, am I happy that eventually the food stuff will be produced edibly, safely, tasteful, cost-effective, without that potential risk coming out to the consumer level like this. And um, I also want, to, also want to ask our industry, I'm talking about the crop protection, is to look favorably towards the, the producer, because the producer is in that set of hands of the agrochemical industry. And Farney mentioned something very important here. They often do not know who is the eventual responsible party. 
is it the registration holder who holds the L number? Is it the marketing company who markets it out there? Or is it the representative called the crop advisor? We don't use that um, <laughs> very dangerous word that Farney used because we're trying to move away from that ethos. But we, the, the, agri the, the farmer is not all, all often sure who is the ultimate responsible party. And unfortunately, the whole value chain from manufacturer right into the farm, I think sometimes the representative might be the weak link. And unless the enforcement for the ethics come down from the registration holder around the farm, it's not going to change. The compliance issue is not good in our country because mm -hmm. compliance is there, but our enforcement is very poor. So we have to work towards a situation where we say we work because we want to do the right thing not because Act 36 or Act 15 or the SABS standard is hanging over our heads. And that is what I would like to summarize from, from the two uh, presentations. But one thing I would like to throw into the market out there is, why do we always have to ask the question, but if I do something, is that going to be done by a competitor? It shouldn't be a question. It should be a case of, I do something because it's the right ethical thing to do. Not because my competitor is doing it or not doing it. It's because I have the right ethos to say I should do it because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Thank you, Howard. I think, uh, Hink, I've got a question for you on that point. Uh, you know, are we as the suppliers or the registration holders of the products, um, uh, crop protection products, and we also refer to as agricultural remedies in the broader sense, bound by any statutory requirements to maintain control over the marketing, the sales, and the application of uh, these crop protection products, down to the value chains, right to farm level. Um, I think I just want to start off by saying um, the Gifsmoos is dead and long live the uh, representative or crop advisor. Uh, <laughs> the Act very clearly states that uh, nobody shall make any recommendation or uh, for a product to be sold that is not registered. So I think that in itself uh, passes on some responsibility to the distributor company uh, to absolutely not make any false or strange or unregistered recommendations. Um, so in that sense, I think it is. But also I think in the sense, if you go broader than that, if you look, and Brian Kieran will address this tomorrow, I'm sure, um, there are certain liabilities if you if you do not adhere to the product label. So for sure, I, I think the, the, the Act clearly states that, that, you know, it shall not be sold by anybody or shall not use uh, the product if, unless it's registered for the purpose of use, yeah, yeah. using it, yeah. yeah. Maybe like a, a question to uh, Umfani. Umfani, are you there? Is, is it cut? Okay. All right, uh, we've lost uh, Fani. Um, maybe El May, um, maybe on the international uh, arena, is a crop protection product stewardship embedded in the international trade agreements or certification frameworks to give effect to adhere to suppliers? I would say yes. Um, the intent is there, for sure. Um, all of us, the, all, this, all the certification schemes out there, whether it's Global Gap or CISA or any other um, uh, international one, has the aim to, to align with legislation, to align with, the, with stewardship, to have these things in place. Um, and I know that, from what Hank is saying, that is definitely something that we want to bring in. We want to make sure that um, those those representatives do it in the right way, and that's also why we ask those questions, whether there is a qualified representative, and then we get questions on qualified. And with CropLife, we've had many discussions, um, CropLife International as well as here in South Africa, about what can we do about the qualifications of those representatives and advisors. Um, we have found that there's a lack in, in that, in the control of that specifically. Okay, thank you, Almay. Um, I would like to give to the floor and the audience. Um, is there any other questions? Chris, in the front. Thanks. It looks like Fani is back. Are you back with us, Fani? If, if he can hear or not, I don't think we can get him, let him get away with some of the statements he made. Okay. Fani, as I understand it, in the last decade, you were one of the rock stars. Uh, if it was... <laughs> That lucrative, what made you jump the fence and go farming? 
uh, it's more practical, you know, on the, on the labels it says you must uh, start spraying at 50% uh, petal fall. And before I got involved in the industry, I thought 50% petal fall is on Wednesday. And then when I got into the practice, I thought, hey, this is much different. But uh, yeah, beside that, this, I don't know, it's a difficult question or it's a, it's a bit of an unfair question. Funny, maybe you, uh, a question from my side. Uh, do the growers or the farmers or the producers of uh, fruit view crop protection product stewardship mostly as just a guarantee of product performance? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, in, it's necessary, but I don't think it's a guarantee. Any some comments? Um, that guarantee thing is quite a nebulous thing. Again, I think it was um, Fani who mentioned that on the labels there's that clause which absconds the registration order of any responsibility if the product is not used strictly according to label directions. Now, we've always maintained within the crop protection arena the principle that the development work going into a product before it gets to the shelf on, on, onto the market is enormously time-consuming and expensive. And I would say 80% of that work is done to ensure that the product will do the job for the farmer if the farmer or the producer then follows label direction. So there is an intrinsic responsibility on the part of the registration order to maybe by label guarantee that if you use my product if, um, according to label instructions, it will have the desired effect with a very limited risk to the human health and environmental health. But the clause is there, particularly to address that issue, to say that if you do not use my product according to label, then me as registration holder, nor Act 36, nor my value chain can guarantee the outcome of your actions. Yeah. And me running a poison center apart from my work at CropLife is uh, I get these calls day to day to day about something happening. We've got an issue now with a certain herbicide, again, having impacts on crops. And every single case is where there was a slight or a strong deviation of the label recommendations. So I don't, don't think that any member of CropLife SA who is a producer of a pesticide is reluctant to guarantee the outcome of the responsible and the label-directed use. But the moment there's a deviation in the form of a recommendation or off-label sale or a marketing ploy, then no one can bind the registration holder to what happened with that particular chemical, whether it's a crop failure or crop damage or poor performance or human health impact or environmental health impact. And I think that is also enshrined in our constitution in the country, that everybody should conduct themselves as a proper citizen. If you don't do that, don't expect the compound to work. It's like buying a vehicle, which is a diesel vehicle, and you put paraffin in the tank. It's not going to perform. And our agrochemicals are not different from that. They're not different from, from pharmaceuticals or stock remedies or industrial chemicals. They all have a label that direct you to make sure the outcome is what you expect it to be. Yeah, the Can one... Uh, sorry, uh, ben, the, the one point I want to make here is, especially with those adjuvants like uh, uh, wetters and stickers, uh, you, you could have uh, a recommendation that... Uh, add the following to this and then it happens that you get uh, probably by the toxicity and, uh, you know the registration holder says no 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 but i didn't uh, stipulate on my label that you uh, have to put away that. okay thank you funny there's another question out of the audience thank you <clears throat> funny uh, you raised something interesting in your talk because you were asking what does the producer expect from the registration holder? And you came up with the, uh, the fact that a lot of uh, more and more citrus is being produced under nets. Now the question is, agrochemicals more often than not are produced and are tested and, and uh, are registered under normal outdoor conditions and the residues that are done, the, the work that is done on the residues and the MRR or rather the, yeah, the, the PHI that is determined is based on those outdoor conditions. Now whose responsibility is it when the farmer decides I'm going to put my whole orchard under nets 
and maybe it's going to have an effect on the, on the uh, breakdown of residues. Is it the industry's responsibility or is it the farmers to try to uh, <clears throat> see what should be done and what sort of PHIs should be observed in the case of uh, citrus, for example, and anets? Yeah, that's a very good question. Very good question. <laughs> um, I, I can't see who asked it, but from many moons ago, the voice sounded like Rob Wood. <laughs> Is that so? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Look, Rob, it's a trend, and the trend is, uh, is increasing exponentially. There's not enough net material in, in the country to supply the demand. So, yeah, what's the response of baby is it? It's a good question, but it's happening. Carrot, any comments from your side on that one? <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I smile at all the comments and the statements and questions here because to me it comes back to two things. First of all, again, label reductions and link very strong, strongly to that is the, the good agricultural practices. Now the way or the moment you change your agronomic practice, don't expect to have the chemical perform according to label directions because you change in the case of the net, you taste the microclimate out there. And we know that a chemical or a biological on a plant surface or a, a fruit surface has a certain breakdown curve, which is determined by the solar energy, determined by the solar heat, determined by UV radiation, and also by the sort of humidity in the atmosphere. And the moment you move away from the open air agriculture and you go into a netter situation or into a hot house, it changes. And you will see, for example, in the case of tomorrow's, just to take a general crop that most people know about, there are certain labels that direct you to only use it for tomatoes in a tunnel situation, other chemicals only for tomatoes in an outro situation. So the fact that finally says it becomes a trend is not a valid argument, despite, fact, despite the fact that finally might be a very good farmer. We can't allow a trend to continue without addressing the trend. So if there's a trend which developed now, it says, but we have to change the economic practice because of whatever to produce our citrus more effectively, and more cost-effectively, there has to be a very serious um, debate between producer and registration order without anybody else in the value chain talking about this because I don't think the value chain people know much about this. So there's got to be a discussion on what do we do to address the issue of the breakdown curve, which will affect the PHI, will, which affect the, the MRL, because in the end, it is beneficial to both the manufacturer of the, of the uh, crop protection compound and also to the producer of the fruit, mm. that they will both benefit. Otherwise, you sit with this issue of a chemical having an unexpected MRL, it affects the export market, and when you affect the export market, it runs up to the value chain again to the manufacturer of the chemical. So we might lose a chemical because of a change in economic practice. And my plea would be, let's talk openly to producer, right to the manufacturer of the compound and leave the other people out, the marketing people, the guys with the sniffy, smelly feeling stuff, because it's a technical issue between the producer of the chemical and the producer of the crop to sort out what do we need to do to address that issue. Mm. Hank, your can comment? Can I make a comment? Yes, please. And uh, what I'm about to say probably will get me either kicked or driven over outside here, but let's go. Um, when it comes to a trend like Fani is mentioning, I'm sure that most of the responsible registration holders will in future include uh, in their residue trials will include the study of residues under these major trend things like nets. We are required now to obtain a registration to do five residue trials at least and now soon it will be GLP trials and just to just to um, burst Fani's bubble a little bit, um, those five trials will cost a company in the region of between six and seven hundred thousand rand. For a, single, for a single active ingredient. And having said that, I believe the act should be changed in respect to award intellectual property protection towards new developments that cost such a large amount of money. Intellectual property protection does not mean um, other companies cannot follow suit with the same PHI, etc., etc. It simply means it cannot be copied for a certain period of time 
And any company can obtain the same results, but they have to do their own work. Because there has to be some form of initiative or um, Geelwortel, what's that in, in English? Uh, incentive for, 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 for companies to start doing these types of trials, which, which cost that amount of money. Um, so, so that is my view. I think, I think companies will definitely start incorporating nets as part of their um, residue studies going forward. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from, the, from one of our online guys. Yeah, he'll just maybe. Um, I'll maybe just while we get the questions from one of our online participants. Um, I've got a question for you on, on that point. Um, let me get a quick here on yeah. Okay, yes, it. Right. Um, now this is one for you. Uh, we have the same molecules registered in the EU without a PHI on certain crops. In which context should be a PHI be based on if the MRL results support the PHI is not required based on the molecule behavior? You get that question? It's quite a heavy <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, well, I'm not sure if I get it 100%, but is it maybe about the fact that if there is a very specific active ingredient that is registered here, but maybe yeah. not overseas in the destination country, and so basically can you use it here and, and still get certified, right? So as I said before, in terms of I can only talk about certification, right, and observing the legislation here. So if it's registered in South Africa for the product, for the pest, for the target, mm. then you can use it. And if it then complies with the current, with the local legislation, yes. If it complies with your country of destination, MRLs, then yes. Um, if there is something set, you, the baseline for us at Global Gap and for what we can do is to that you have to comply with your, with your customer, first of all. I mean, first of all, with local legislation, but I mean beyond that is with your customer's requirements and then any legal requirements that's in that country. Um, I think something that Gerard said that's very important for us as well is this, um, the risk assessments that needs to be done. Um, I think it links up a lot with, okay, can I apply this, this pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, whatever you're going to apply, can I apply it in South Africa legally? And then what is it going to, what's the effect for my, my, my market where I'm going to sell this? Will it be accepted or not? And sometimes producers don't know where they're going to send their produce but they need, unfortunately need to know these things so that they can have a legal trade, basically. We don't try to be a barrier to trade, but some of these things are, by, in nature, barriers to trade. Mm. Okay. I think also if I can comment again, I think um, the, the purpose of obtaining a residue uh, profile for a product on a specific crop is to look at as many as possible situations uh, where the product is applied to a specific crop under specific growing conditions that can differ from one climatic zone to another. And therefore, I don't think it's always applicable that residues from overseas can be used or just transposed to the South African market. Right. So I don't think that is, a, that, is a, uh, that, that is something that can happen. I, I, I support the idea that, uh, that local residues have to be produced locally under local conditions. Of course, there are some molecules uh, which are exempt from MRLs and re uh, from residues in MRLs, and um, and then you can just apply to have that extended into South Africa, uh, and and sometimes that is granted. Thank you. There's just a comment from one of our online guests. Uh, the speaker's comments on generics is misleading. The generic does not have to be 30% effective. It must show a bioefficacy of 30% of the crops on the originators label and residues are required where re relevant. Harat? Yeah, I think there was right. just a little grammatical error in what yes. Fani presented there. So a generic company cannot claim a 30% effectively. It, it must do at least 30% of the crops and yes. still show the required efficacy as according to the guidelines of Act 36. Yes. I, I apologize, that's what I meant. <laughs> didn't come uh, Harold, while we're on that out, topic, is there sufficient responsible use training offered to growers and their staff by suppliers, or does that responsibility lies elsewhere? 
I'm very happy to say that um, despite us not getting very good stats from our industry in the last two years, if I speak to individual companies, both at a supply level and distribution level, there is enormous training happening all over the country. And this is not only to the, the spray operators and the farm workers and the store people that, that manage the pesticide stores on the farms. It is very often aimed at the farm owner level and farm manager level. So our distribution companies, many of them, our um, supply companies, a lot of them, and even CropLife SA, we offer training to literally tens of thousands of people per year. And in CropLife SA, we promote this. We have a training module that we offer to our members, and then they become trainers themselves. So I think we're doing pretty well, but it doesn't mean that we are totally happy. We must always do better and better and better. And over the last two years, I've seen, I would say, an escalation of possibly 500% training um, from our whole industry, in other words, crop life, asset distribution and supply chain going out the farm level. And I see more enthusiasm building up. So I feel very positive about this, even though I don't think we had a good ballpark yet, but I can see a definite escalation. I think we're doing pretty well. Wonderful. Fani, um, I've got a question for you um, out of a grower point of view. Um, do you think growers are prepay, prepared to pay a little extra for crop protection solutions from suppliers with good stewardship principles, or is their crop protection products um, acquisition purely based on price? No, I think the 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 big uh, the big farmers, the twenty percent that represent eighty percent of the uh, of the production, they are willing to to stick to. Uh, the products that uh, have good stewardship that come from uh, re reputable companies, the original registration holder, rather than just going for price. Because uh, the difference at the end of the day is not that much in terms of production costs. No. Really very open. Is there any other questions from the floor in the audience? Ben, may I add something onto what Fani said now? Yeah. I, I hear what Fani says about the 20% doing 80% of the production. Now, I have the privilege of getting the call from thousands of farmers every year, and I'm very pleasantly surprised at how farmers' mindsets are changing to not going for price alone, but going for that total... I think Kobus Hartman mentioned this morning, we don't sell chemicals, we sell a solution. And even with upcoming farmers that are mostly the black farmers of the country, I ask them, but why do you want to buy this particular product? And I don't talk about price. They say, because I trust the company. And that's something which is good. And I see that trust being come, becoming a very important far, part of the farmer's decision, what do I buy? It's not just what is the shelf, the shelf price. It's about, is this thing trustable? Do I trust the company? Do I trust the support they give me? And I think this is an awareness which is rapidly gaining momentum in South Africa. Absolutely. Here's a question from one of our online guests. All amendments to labels are possible to suit different trends. The question rather is how will the registrar keep up? They take three to four years to get the product registered. <laughs> I think that's what uh, everything, everybody's on the same page here. Yeah. <laughs> Could we maybe treat that as a rhetorical question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it was one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, here's a uh, question for you. Maybe um, there's a session later in the program covers the product life cycle. How do you view the stewardship responsibility of the grower and the supplier in this regard? I don't think there's much difference in the stewardship principles between the supplier and, and the end user. I mean, some basic principles such as storage under good conditions, uh, under conditions as specified on a label, use it only in accordance to the label. You know, once you've used the container, it's a plastic container, triple rinse. These, these messages should be the same from, from, the, from the distributor to, to the end user, and the end user should adhere to it as well. Um, the end user certainly also has a huge responsibility when it comes to, um, when it comes to stewardship. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm very happy to see uh, and I'm very happy to say that uh, because of the focus and the drive from Gerard and the Rob, uh, Rod and other people within crop life, we are rapidly moving towards a more uh, stewardship-friendly uh, uh, 
milieu, society arrangement, and, and it's driven by, 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 by the recycling of, of the plastic containers. Um, so I, th I think both of them have a huge responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd like to distinguish between the, uh, you know, the, the, the growers that produce food and fiber for the local consumption versus the farmers or the growers that's mainly for the export market. Um, that sometimes I feel that, that the growers for the export markets, they have to adhere to certain um, uh, uh, global gap um, audits. Um, otherwise, they cannot have market access for the uh, for produce. Um, El May, do export growers fully understand the stewardship principles that Hink mentioned here and the key role that the suppliers play in these stewardships? from an export grower's point of view. I will come back now to the local guys. Okay, yeah, because I would also like to come down to the, to the ones that's not exporting. I think, well, I don't know, I, I cannot speak on behalf of export producers. Fanny can tell you more about that, but I think, I think more and more they do understand the requirements from, especially when we look into um, exports into Europe, there's a lot of demand on the Green Deal, on, there's, mm -hmm. there's lots of things coming into place where they need to show that they are responsible, that they are implementing these things, whether it's with or without a global gap certificate. Um, we are just a means of helping that producer to show that they are actually um, having the stewardship and doing their due diligence and actually implementing this. I mean, nobody can show something unless they have a certificate. You know, I've been audited. I'm not saying the audits are foolproof or anything like that, but that is a way of showing that the producers are doing that. And I think that's also where we as a certification program owner would like to go to is to not say this is you're only doing this to have market access, but rather you're doing this to show that you are taking on these responsibilities. You want to be a responsible farmer. You are doing these things for not only for yourself, but for the whole industry, for your kids' kids, for everybody who needs food, for everybody who wants to farm in future. Mm. Because any scandal mm. is not only for that producer, coming down to that producer, but to the whole industry, and it's a knock-on for the whole farming industry. Mm. So I've, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. Exactly, what, what, what the right Farad thing mentioned. to do. But your view on the local, um, the local growers only for the local market? Yeah, I would hate to say that what you sort of implied in the beginning is maybe there's this differentiation in terms of how they see their responsibilities. I think the exact same responsibility is there for a producer who, who supply only the, the local market. Whether you're big, small, fresh fruit and vegetables, I don't care what you grow, you need to have that same type of responsibility, you need to take the same responsibility. I always, when I used to do training, say these things are not only there for the European retailers or for the retailer, it's also for you and your family. You also eat the same food, you do the same thing, so it's show that, that you're doing the right thing to everybody. So mm. locally, internationally, it doesn't matter. There's still a lot of work to do. Yes. yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Harold, maybe... You yeah, I, I agree with Elmay. Whether you produce food for local consumption or for export, the standards are exactly the same. So Africans are no different to Europeans or people in China or Russia or North America. We're all human beings. We all have the right to safe and healthy foodstuffs. Our problem lies in the, call it the, I wouldn't even say the compliance because the compliance I just mentioned is something you have to do. It's the ethos. And the export markets are driven by an ethos which I think was largely catalyzed by Global Gap, which the local producers um, haven't developed that ethos yet. I can see when you look at our container management program, in the Western Cape, it is 92% plus. It's a joy to work there. Where if you look in, I'm not going to mention the province because somebody might shoot me, but a certain grain province, the compliance is not even 40%. So we battle there, and tomorrow you'll hear from our recyclers how they battle to get the... the the ethos established there are container management. So it's a, it's a case of, I think, many, many moons ago, Global Gap catalyzed this thing. It was basically a compliance thing, but it moved over to a Global Gap ethos. And if you speak to big Global Gap farmers like Farney, and I've got friends in the Ganubi area in the Eastern Cape, they do container management not because it's a Global Gap requirement, because it's a light thing to do for them. Mm -hmm. And they like to show, but I've had every container on my farm recycled and turned into some other commodity. So I think it's a very important thing to understand that we hold the stick over our farmers and over our members sitting here today of the compliance issue. 
but there's a rapid move from the compliance understanding to an ethos that oh, I've got to do the right thing simply because I want to be a good corporate citizen or about to be a good farmer. Mm. And I like to, to, to tell you also that in my discussion with many farmers that call me, I start getting it from all farmers where they produce little one little plot with their own cabbage in the backyard or where they produce tons and tons of export. It's a move to that. And I think from CropLife SA and our members and the Agriculture Producer Organization, Global Gap and CESAR, it's all driving this thing to get away from the compliance thing to becoming an ethos thing. And that mm -hmm. makes me very excited for the future because it means we're going to do things simply because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But, but then I'm just asking, you know, it's the right thing to do. Um, uh, I mean, you've got that in your presentation, that first slide, the stick, you know, like the, the teachers, you can, you can use a stick. But maybe it must we look at uh, regulating, regulating of stewardship. Um, is it something that needs to be regulated or is it something that uh, should be ingrained in the business practices of suppliers, growers, distributors, um, even the logistics? You know, everybody must do it. Or you don't think that regulation of stewardship is no. the way to go? I don't think, I don't believe firmly that you regulate stewardship. Stewardship is an ethos thing, and you cannot regulate somebody's ethics. Ethics is a personal thing. Yeah. We live in a country which is absolutely overregulated. If you look on the scale of regulation, our regulatory environment in South Africa sits at the topmost 10 of the world, even though our enforcement is the bottommost 10 of the, of the world. So more and more regulation is not going to help anybody. Mm. So stewardship is something which I want to do, not because the government or state department tells me you should do it. Mm. And we can see with our container management, long before we got to the idea of an EPR, which we will discuss tomorrow and so on, the container management developed because mm. it's an ethical thing. In the beginning, yes, we had a couple of uphill battles. We mm. climbed a steep mountain. Now, it's plain sailing mm. because it becomes an ethical thing for people mm. to do. So I don't believe stewardship can be regulated by any party. No, it's coming from inside. It's not from no. the outside. It's a it's culture. Coming, yeah, it's, it's a culture. It's a culture yeah. And it's from inside. Okay. Uh, we've got a question there from Rod. Just a, a comment more than anything, Ben. So um, um, I'm sort of running the risk of being like Hank and getting kicked and run over in the car park later. But um, it, it's a comment that's, that um, Corbus uh, and I have just been looking at over WhatsApp. Just because Act 36 is 75 years old doesn't mean it's inherently a terrible piece of legislation. Absolutely. If the Act had been regularly updated with new regulations over the last 75 years, there's some really cool things in the Act that, that, that are great. And as Gerard has just mentioned, if we had a um, inspectorate service that, that was correctly funded, both with money and bums on buckies, uh, the, the, the compliance would also go, go through the roof. So I just want to make the point, it's not just because it's an old act that things aren't working at the, at the office of the registrar. Absolutely not. So w I don't think we need that perception to, to be in people's minds, uh, to minds after today. And then just a comment, the draft regulation was out for, for comment, the new one in support of Act 36. Uh, it's waiting for it to be published. Um, Fakile sits on the registrar's head regularly to find out when we're getting it. But um, there is going to be some form of mention of stewardship in the new regulation. The registrar has told us that. So um, it, it's not just going to be ethos or ethics. It, it is certainly going to be written into the new regulation. We're expecting it. But uh, I just wanted to make those points. The Act is not inherently bad just because of its age. Absolutely right. Uh, there's just a question here in the front. Chris Thompson. Thank you. I have another question for Fani. Fani, with what we've been talking about with the, the delays in getting new registrations and also the number of products we're losing, can you give us an impression of how it's impacted on you at Unifruity itself and, and you very close to the citrus industry? to the rest of the citrus growers. Has it made it more difficult and perhaps made uh, farmers go into more risky type of uh, applications to try and overcome the shortage of, of registered solutions? Now, Chris, um, it's becoming more and more difficult. We have less tools in our 
toolbox to, uh, to get a squeaky clean fruit into the market. Uh, if you want to do uh, risky decisions, the market's going to sort you out. Uh, they're going to find uh, residues or something like that, and, and the market will sort you out. And uh, I couldn't agree with Gerard more that uh, stewardship is an is a, is a ethos. It uh, comes from internal. So, yeah, it's becoming more difficult. And uh, the, the drive is... Uh, especially the German supermarkets, they want no residues, nothing. But they would like very, very clean fruit. Any other questions from the audience or from our guests online? I think I'm going to wrap up this session. Um, Harrod, maybe your last comments on, for the session. Um, just to reiterate what I said earlier on, that stewardship is, like Fani said, it's an internal thing. It's for me as an individual or for me as a company or for crop life as a family of companies. And I wouldn't like the state or the government to come and start imposing certain sanctions on us in, in terms of an act or regulations. They must do what they have to do in terms of the current act. So it's our job to, to perpetuate this idea of stewardship and to build it up and to work with groups like Global Gap, which has been, I think, one of our best catalysts for stewardship in the agriculture arena. So stewardship is there. It's just a case of we have to live stewardship day by day and expand on the stewardship initiatives without the stick hanging over our heads. Thank you, Gerard. Elmay? I think Gerard summarized it very well. Um, yeah, we as Global Gap, we really see it as good agricultural practices and the implementation of that by producers for the right reasons. Um, to get the market access, as Fani said, you do risky things, the market will sort you out. Um, sometimes it's quicker than other times. Um, we're looking forward to work with CropLife International and on local levels to maintain this, the, the initi initiatives that we have and also to see how we can strengthen that. So wherever there is an opportunity to work together, we'll be more than happy to connect. Hank? I agree with all that's been said. I think uh, us South Africans are quite a hardy bunch of guys. We always seem to find solutions for very difficult problems and we are faced with major problems in the industry. But I believe there's, there's only one way in which you can overcome this, and that is through very honest and very straightforward and very thorough communication amongst all role players. And then I just want to reiterate, the only th way that this can happen is if there is more participation by members of the ag chem community in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the business of crop life. I think very few people realize how much information there is available on the Crop Life website. Very few people realize how many people and experts participated to get that all together. There's an enormous amount of knowledge out there, but we need the participation of the members. Thank you, Inc. And Fanny, last word. Yeah, um, <laughs> the one thing that baffles me is uh, this bottleneck at the registrar and you can't get things going, you know. I come from the era of Dr. Bott and John Vermeil and so on. They had very supportive staff and, and it, it didn't take that long. I cannot see how the whole ag chem in, industry can tolerate uh, this blockage, this wall. And it sounds like it's one person, but I'm speaking on the correction. It's, there needs to be an urgent discussion with the Minister of Agriculture and even I Funny, thank you a lot. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this session. Um, we're off now to lunch. I would like to close and say thank you to everybody. There's a lot of work to be done, um, and especially on the participation in crop life, all the members. Um, thanks, Elme, for your uh, input from the Global Gap site. Um, really appreciate it. Hara, thank you very much. Um, Hink Mumfani, thanks a lot. And uh, the next session will start in a due course after lunch. Mm -hmm.